Thanks everybody. Oh, can you hear me? Okay. <laughs> Thanks everybody. Um, I just wanted to say that uh, I think that Develop Brighton has done a really great job with diversity and inclusivity this year. Um, being a Yaki and a Cherokee person myself, it's great to see you know all the different people here and all the different talks. Um, also, I wanted to announce that um, we are hiring for my next game. Uh, right there. <laughs> if you're really good, send an e send an email on the CV to that to that email address. I'm going to talk about uh, Wolfenstein 3D. It's a pretty old game. It's now just over 30 years old. So this is a classic game postmortem. <laughs> um, so if you don't if you don't know uh, who I am, uh, I'm a co-founder of Vid Software, and uh, and it's finally taught time to talk about the making of Wolfenstein 3D. So it was our 1992 game that really started the modern day FPS. So to get started, I need to roll back the clock just a little bit before we start making Wolfenstein 3D. So here's the situation with id Software during Christmas of 1991. We just delivered Commander Keen 4 and 5 after we delivered uh, Commander Keen 6, which is called Aliens Ate My Babysitter. And in uh, Catacomb 3D a month earlier than that, uh, which was the first texture mapped 3D game. Uh, the last six months of 1991, we started and we shipped five games. Back in 1992, 16 color EGA graphics were the norm and the Sound Blaster audio card was really just getting, you know, gaining ground in the market. And high-end CPUs at that time were 386 and uh, 33DXs. The software was situated in Madison, Wisconsin. And in the winter, it was freezing cold, and there was no reason to go outside. So now, it's January of 1992, we start working on Commander Keen 7. And we worked, so we worked on a prototype uh, that had parallaxing backgrounds, and it looked good. But when the demo was finished after we spent probably a week on it, uh, one night I just said, I don't want to make another set of Keen games right now. <laughs> um, it was like 1 in the morning. We just spent six months making Keen 4, 5, and 6, and uh, I'm tired of it. And Adrian just said, yeah, I'm sick of Keen. Um, John Carmack turned in his chair and just said, hmm, as he viewed the carnage in the room. He said, we should make another 3D game using texture mapping like Catacomb 3D. We can do even better this next time. So Tom, who's our creative director, uh, he understood that we were burned out on Keen, so he immediately started coming up with ideas. He came up with an idea for a more advanced version of Hover Tank 1, uh, the Hover, Hover Tank 1's idea, but um, with you walking around in first person instead of driving a tank. I didn't really think it was the next level idea that I was looking for. Hover Tank 1 was our very first 3D game that we made in May of 1991. So. The idea just kind of came to me instantly. Why don't we just make a new 3D version of the classic Castle Wolfenstein from 1981? That idea won instant approval. Uh, me and John and Tom were Apple II gamers. And uh, we had played so much Castle Wolfenstein 10 years earlier. Uh, it was just an obvious win. It was an amazing game. So we started making Wolfenstein around mid-January. And we started with the Catacomb 3D engine which was in 16 color EGA mode. Adrian made this title screen at the time. Uh, he started making character sprites in 16 colors. He could tell that there was gonna be a lot of work put into the art because these characters needed to rotate and they needed to animate on every rotation. So we asked Jim Norwood who was, uh, if he could help with art. Jim was one of Apogee's game developers. He did all of his own games art and programming. Six months earlier, he licensed our Keen 4 engine to make his game Biomenace. Jim starts making 16 color sprites uh, and rotations based on Adrian's first frames of animation to kind of show here's, here's the kind of character that I want. Um, and at the time, Apogee Software was our publisher and Wolfenstein 3D was going to be their next big game. Uh, Scott Miller, who owned Apogee uh, in later 3D realms, he called to find out about this new game. 
we knew we were making a new game. We wanted to know what it was about. Told him the premise behind Wolfenstein 3D, and he loved it. He knew, you know, we had just made Catacomb 3D, and he was really excited to publish Wolfenstein, which would be his company's first published when it's done 3D game. So near the end of the call, Scott said, hey, forget 16 color EGA graphics, make it 256 color VGA. And well, that was a huge change. <laughs> um, I told John Carmack about the switch. Hey, we need to ditch the 16 color EGA stuff. So he thought about it for a minute and he said, it would actually be cleaner code wise and doable at a high speed. So since we made the switch, Adrian decided that he, he wanted to handle the VGA transition himself, uh, just figuring it out. You know, he had to figure out the palette because with EGA, you were already assigned a palette. With VGA, you could just create it. So he wanted to figure out the perfect palette. Um, and so each of VGA's 256 palette slots could be one of 16 million colors. And uh, we just tell Jim Nor Norwood, hey, <laughs> we're switching. Uh, thank you for helping. And, and uh, he just went back to working on Bi Biomenace. So we decided that each episode uh, of the game was going to have 10 levels in it. And the plan was to make a shareware episode and two additional episodes that would be purchased. People would, it's, it's try before you buy. <laughs> um, John got the, the renderer uh, up and running pretty quickly. Took about a week. Uh, you know, didn't run very, it didn't run super fast, but it was very usable for level design. So to represent the levels, he was using a 2D matrix, which was... Uh, it was the same kind of data that my TED5 editor was made for, which we use for Commander Keen. And back then, screen resolution was 320 by 200 pixels for almost every game. So, so <clears throat> I worked on modifying TED5 so we could use it to make the levels for Wolfenstein. Uh, we used a level loading code from Commander Keen, and we set up the levels to have walls and a background layer. Uh, and actors, items, and paths in this foreground layer. So on the design side of things, Tom came up with the four enemies that we would see in the Sharer episode. We'd have killer dogs, we'd have guards, SS, and then the boss. So Tom starts making the icons for TED5 so we could place enemies, items, wall types, and doors. Um, he also made some very crude drawings for Adrian <laughs> to go by. And then Adrian immediately started making sprites off of these. And Adrian was our only artist. And he needed to make all the textures for the items, the weapons, the walls, all four enemies, which had rotations so you could see them from behind even. Um, each rotation needed walking animation cycles and being hit and shooting and dying. So... Tom could start making levels in TED5, and uh, he started working on episode one, level one. We wanted Wolfenstein's audio to really stand out. Uh, the Sound Blaster audio card was doing really well at the time, and it had digital audio playback. Uh, so we could actually recreate the original Castle Wolfenstein enemy speech, which was done 10 years earlier on, on uh, really primitive speakers, um, but we could make it sound really great. And, uh, and just have, and also have realistic gunshots too. Our music would still be in MIDI, uh, and all the sound effects had to have a MIDI version and a PC speaker version for backward compatibility, just in case players didn't have a sound blaster. So I modified my Muse uh, utility to handle importing digital audio uh, wave files. So when we started creating the gameplay, um, we're replicating all of the original game's stealth features like searching dead bodies, dragging dead bodies around the hallways so enemy soldiers wouldn't see them and become suspicious, um, and attempting to break into storage lockers for food and ammo. But while we were adding uh, all of these features into the game, and we were playing the game constantly, we started to notice that the more fun part of the game was just running and gunning. So stopping to drag a guard or to unlock a chest, it really just like slowed down this innovative high speed running and blasting Nazis. <laughs> that was the real fun <laughs> core of the game. <laughs> so the entire time that you're making a game, you're trying to find the fun as soon as you can. Sometimes the fun is not in the features that you thought were going to be fun. 
So you have to listen to the game. And the fun that was in Wolfenstein was really in that high speed running and incredibly violent gunning. The sound of the Gatling gun and the enemy sighting sounds, the pain sounds uh, and the death sounds really were the heartbeat of the game. And the drive for speed actually ended up simplifying our game design. So we really just focused on that core. Anything that slowed the game down just got ripped out. So all those features that we added were gone. You know, goodbye dragging dead guards, uh, sayonara lock chests, and audio searching guards. So now it's February. <laughs> all that in one month. <clears throat> so we're working on all parts of the games, uh, the first enemies, uh, the guard and the SS. And we have the knife, and we have a pistol, and we have a machine gun working. So the early levels are slowly getting some definition. Adrian you know, is drawing wall textures. Uh, so the first level looked like you're in a prison section of the castle because that's you know, you're captured and you're trying to break out. Um, but let's roll back the clock just one month. So I really love the King's Quest games back in the day. Um, and King's Quest V had come out months earlier, and I played it, and I loved it. And I really noticed at the time that Sierra was starting to publish uh, kids' games like EcoQuest. So I mailed Roberta Williams uh, our latest Commander Keen. And this is discs in the mail mailing. <laughs> she loved it. And she asked if we would fly to their office to talk business. Oh, shit. Okay. <laughs> so the next week, we all flew out to Sierra Online's office in Oakhurst, California. They were only 20 minutes from Yosemite National Park. We had just left Madison, which was freezing. And now we're in sunny California where it's warm. We all noted how nice that was. So our first visit, uh, well, our visit at Sierra was really amazing. Ken Williams, who was a co-founder, he walked us through the entire place. They had about 200 employees. We had a meeting with game developers uh, that were working on the Adventure Game Interpreter at the time. We met Warren Schwader, who was a legendary Apple II programmer who was mentioned in Stephen Levy's 1984 book, Hackers. And he's someone that we knew from his, his really great games, Threshold and Sammy Lightfoot and Time Zone. <clears throat> Incredibly, Warren's first game, which is called High Rose Cribbage, was played by my father for 13 years straight <laughs> on the Apple II. And when the Apple II was finally replaced with a PC, he then switched over to Sears Hoyle games that was also written by Warren. <laughs> and he played that for another 20 years. So Tom and I got on our hands and knees and we said, we're not worthy <laughs> to Warren. Um, Ken and Roberta took us to their house and they showed us around their house and while well, Roberta was showing Tom her King's Quest 6 notebook because she's already like designing the next game, I had a prototype version of Wolfenstein on a disc that I ran on Ken's home PC to show him what we were making. He was not visually impressed. After about 30 seconds of watching, he wanted to show me the new game they're working on, Red Baron Online. So I was dumbfounded. <laughs> Here was the future, the start of a new genre, the first person shooter, but Ken didn't really pay it any notice. <laughs> so it felt like a replay of like 18 months earlier when I showed Softdisk employees uh, the Dangerous Dave and copyright infringement demo that heralded the smooth scrolling breakthrough that made possible high quality platform games on the PC and was really the start of its software. So we go back to Sierra from um, to Ken's office and Ken really wanted to talk business. He wanted to know how much money our little company is making. This is after one year. He could see that there's, <clears throat> there's just four of us. I tell him, well, we're bringing about 50,000 a month in, uh, from our shareware registration sales. And Ken says, no way, that's not possible. And I'm, I just showed him a printout of our last uh, three months of deposits and showed him that we're just stacking income through three different companies paying us. Uh, so. Ken then made us an offer of two and a half million in Sierra stock to buy, uh, to do the deal, to buy its software. So we excitedly said, thank you. We would talk about it when we got back and then we flew back to Madison. So back in the office, we got really excited about the idea of selling our company to Sierra. At 50,000 a month income, it would take us four years to make the money that we could make instantly by, by uh, selling to Sierra. 
So I wanted to make sure that we got some immediate cash from this sale. <laughs> I got on the phone with Ken and I told him about, you know, we talked about it and we really do want to be part of the Sierra family. I said, we need a hundred thousand cash up front with a signed letter of intent to start doing this deal. <laughs> so Ken thought for a second and said, no, thanks. <laughs> Good luck with everything guys. Um, so the hundred K was just a little too rich for him. Well, we had a game to make, so we just got back to work. No more doing deals. It's time to hammer out this game. So the engine was really solid by the end of February. We had several Nazis in the game. Uh, with the addition of the SS and the German Shepherd Nazi, <laughs> we added patrol paths <laughs> so they could be moving around and make the game feel more realistic. <clears throat> and now it's March of 1992. One interesting feature that we added uh, to create more suspense was a concept called sound zones. So this is how it works. We have lots of rooms in our levels, especially back then the boxy Wolfenstein levels. All these rooms have doors that open and they close which is something that you do not want to hear if you did not open that door by yourself. So when the player shoots a gun, we want to make sure that enemies can hear that. But we don't want all the enemies in the entire game to be activated and empty the rooms looking for the player. What we did is we added sound rooms, uh, sound zones for uh, every room. The floors in the room were always the same color on the screen uh, for the entire level. So it wasn't part of that level data that we're drawing for what's in the room. So the background layer of maps is only really used for the walls and door placement. We decided to use the floor space inside of a room uh, as a sound zone designation. So we decided to use these 36 amazing specially co uh, colored tiles down at the bottom uh, to use for sound zones so we could specify where enemies could hear player weapon sounds. So if you're out in a hallway and you shoot a guard, no one inside the room can hear you unless you open the door. Uh, you see, when you open the door, the sound zone in the new room will fill, would flood fill the area that you're in. And when you shoot your gun, the sound will be heard by every enemy that's standing on the same sound zone that you're on. So the sound zone of the room becomes the sound zone where you're standing if you're outside the room. This actually allowed us to be really devious. We could put a matching sound zone in a really far away room that would alert guards there and you'd hear them opening and closing doors on their way to you. So Adrian realized at this time that there was a lot of art to make. So it would be really smart to get some help at this point. <laughs> we decided um, Kevin Cloud, who was our Gamer's Edge producer, would be a, a good choice. Back in uh, 1991, Gamer's Edge was the, the place where we were selling our games. And so he was our producer and we decided that we would, hey, do you want to Want to come work for us? So Kevin was an artist, uh, a really good artist. And Tom called him up and asked if he'd be interested in working with us. Uh, you know, would you would you like to do art instead of management? So Kevin was definitely interested, and he just decided to drive up from Shreveport, Louisiana, for this interview. So Kevin Kevin brought his wife with him on the nonstop drive from Shreveport, over 19 hours to Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, when we met with them. He didn't really seem tired at all. He was really excited, in fact. We had a really great interview with him, and we went to lunch. We all felt at lunch that he's just a really great fit, and uh, we made him an offer, and he accepted the offer. His wife came along for a reason. You know, If the interview went, went really well, they would need to find a place to live, and she wanted to be part of that decision. So, in fact, we all decided that we wanted to move from the apartments that we picked blindly when we moved up to Wisconsin. And especially concerning were the drug raids with cops blowing in the doors of the neighbors <laughs> who were dealing drugs. It was a really shady part of town that we lived in. We then, since we'd been there for six months, we had a much better idea of where we want to live in Madison at the time. So we all decided to go on this apartment hunting trip. And after several hours, we found a, an apartment complex that we all liked. We tended to kind of live in all sit in the same apartment complex so we could just get back and forth to work quickly and not have to slide too far on the ice. Um, so we finished looking for apartments in late afternoon. Uh, we decided we're going to sign the rental agreements the next day. Uh, we had dinner. Yeah, Kevin and his wife went back to their hotel, and then we just went back to work as usual. Um, a lot of his biggest decisions happen really late at night. <laughs> So uh, our, unof our unofficial motto was, we are the wind. 
We'll just change our mind to do anything. So around 1 a.m., I again say to the other guys, I hate the winters here. <laughs> I hate the snow and the ice and the freezing cold. I don't want to live up here anymore. <laughs> and Adrian says, I hate it too. <laughs> John agreed, the cold is not as much fun as the heat. <laughs> so after talking for a couple hours, we decided that we would move down to Dallas, where it was really hot. <laughs> And we decided we are not signing leases the next day. Uh, then we remembered, oh, wait a minute. Kevin's going to get up early, and he's going to go sign the lease. So we called up Kevin's hotel, and it was super, super late. So they just would only leave a message. We're frantically leaving a message. Don't sign the lease. Call us before you leave your room. <laughs> we wanted to just tell Kevin that his new job would be in Dallas. Well, Kevin got the message, and he thought he was fired before he was hired. <laughs> so he breathed a sigh of relief when he found out it was just us deciding to move down to Dallas, uh, a place where he already wanted to live. So he was surprised, but actually really happy about it. So Tom and I flew to Dallas, and we were driven around by Scott Miller and uh, George Broussard of Apogee Software. They really... Uh, they helped us find a really great apartment complex in Mesquite, and we signed leases for uh, five apartments, and one of those apartments was going to be our office. Yes, Hid Software would have its own office that was not located in someone else's apartment. It would finally have its own office apartment. <laughs> so during the move to Dallas, we also hired Jay Wilbur, who's another soft disk employee um, that I personally had known since 1986, years before soft disk. Uh, both Kevin and Adrian would start on April 1st. Uh, in fact, Kevin still works at Ed Software today. In the meantime, it was March, and we kept on working away. We kept making enemies work. Uh, we made levels. We incorporated some music from uh, you know Bob, that Bobby Prince had delivered to us, and we got the menu system working. After making several levels, we really noticed like something's missing in the game. The gameplay was definitely streamlined <laughs> to be a fast-paced shooter, but the game was just missing this element that we included in like all of our previous games. Uh, we had no way of hiding a secret room. <laughs> we we love secrets in in our levels, and we decided you know probably the best solution for this game uh, would be uh, to put in what we call a push wall. The player would press the space bar. And if this wall was pushable, if it's a secret wall, then you would hear the stone sliding back and it would reveal this new area. Well, John didn't want to add push walls because it violated the sanctity of his code base. <laughs> <laughs> it would be a hack. Uh, we told John, we really need push walls to like add anything for players to hunt for. You know, everything in the game was just obvious. It was right in front of you. Um, and we needed to add something extra, something hidden and mysterious. So we told this to John in early March. By April, he'd heard the request enough times that he did hack push walls into the engine. And Tom was so excited that he immediately started adding secret passageways everywhere in the first episode. And so now it's, it's April of 1992. Um, Kevin Cloud and Jay Wilbur start work. We move down right in the middle of making this game. Uh, one of Jay's most important jobs as the biz guy, uh, just after uh, starting work, is to track down who owned this Wolfenstein trademark. We love the name. We knew that we couldn't call it Wolfenstein. Um, so we spent a lot of time trying out other names, but nothing had the coolness of the word Wolfenstein. Muse Software published the original Castle Wolfenstein in 1981. Muse was situated in Maryland. Jay hunted around. And remember, this is before the internet. <laughs> and he did find the rights holder. It was a woman who used to buy assets of businesses that were shut down. And she bought all of Muse's intellectual properties and trademarks. So Jay offered her 5,000 bucks for the trademark, and it was a deal. <laughs> we didn't need to think about a new name anymore. Um, we decided to add... 3D after it, um, and so Wolfenstein 3D it is. In fact, the 3D is because it was Wolfenstein 3. There was a Wolfenstein 1, uh, Return to uh, Beyond Castle Wolfenstein was number 2, and we made the number 3 was a reboot. So near mid-April, we needed to get all of the audio made, 
uh, and in the game. Bobby Prince had been composing songs for us, um, but we needed sound effects too. And uh, he also needed to see the game and get a feel for it. So we flew Bobby down and he brought a ton of gear and he got it all set up and he started making music. Our office was really small. It was a one bedroom loft apartment office. <laughs> Luckily, most of the development was upstairs. Adrian, Tom and I, we had our desks upstairs. Uh, this is Tom's desk and you can see Wolf Design 3D on his screen. John Carmack, that's not him. Uh, <laughs> had his desk downstairs, but after the engine was done and the enemy AI worked, uh, John decided to take his computer back to his own apartment for some peace and quiet because Tom and I made way too much noise while we we're developing games. <laughs> and Bobby Prince used that area downstairs to set up all of his equipment. That's Bobby. Uh, and that was Bobby while making Wolfenstein, by the way, in this case. <laughs> Uh, one of the things that Bobby brought with him was this huge sampling keyboard. And he also uh, bought, brought this really nice big microphone. And that's what we use to record all the voices in the game uh, right there. All the voices in the game are made by me and Tom. Uh, Adrian did the Schustoffel sound effect for the SS guards. And we had a lot of fun coming up with all the crazy Nazi death sounds. Even though we were still making the Sharer episode, we needed to record all of the audio for all three episodes of the game. So we recorded Dr. Shabs and Hitler. Uh, Bobby would be leaving before we shipped the game, and it was mid-April by this time. We estimated that we would probably ship sometime around the end of June. Uh, Scott Miller called, and he asked how close we were to getting the Sharer episode finished. I told him, we're really close. And then Scott had an idea. He was so excited that he wanted to upload the shareware version the second that it was finished and start taking orders. We hadn't even started on the other two episodes. And he knew that, but he also knew that we could make levels pretty fast now that the entire engine, you know, the, the design had settled down. So the idea was that we would upload the shareware, he would start selling it, and then we would go faster <laughs> making the last two episodes of the game. So 20 levels had to be made. 20 of these extra levels had to be made. And I would definitely be helping to get these levels done so the entire game you know, so could be done. And then we could like ship it off to customers. Before Scott decided on the pricing of the shareware version, he had an epiphany. He wanted to try something new. He thought that if he could sell an additional three episodes of levels, that would be enough to justify writing a hit book and all three pieces of this Wolfenstein 3D could be smartly priced like this. $35 for the trilogy, which was 30 levels, $15 for an additional 30 levels that we named in the Nocturnal Missions, and 10 bucks for a hit book that detailed all 60. So it was an inspired bit of marketing. If you spent $35 for three episodes, why wouldn't you double the amount of levels that you were getting for an additional mere 15 bucks? And what if you got lost? <laughs> there was no internet back then. So, you know, a hint book would be invaluable for this game. So Scott asked if we could make another three episodes and a hint book by the end of June. <laughs> Tom and I looked at each other and we said, yeah, we think we could. <laughs> so we were in the home stretch at the end of April uh, because this was the most violent game we'd ever seen. <laughs> Tom and I came up with the idea of putting this fake rating screen at the beginning, warning players that Wolfenstein 3D was rated PC-13, profound carnage. Back in the 70s, movies had this kind of rating in the U.S., uh, but it said PC PG-13 for parental guidance. So we just did it as a joke. Um, but now, it turns out, Wolfenstein 3D was the first voluntarily rated game. <laughs> okay, so now it's May. <laughs> May 1992, and we were just days away from finishing this game. I'm the person who always got the games put together for distribution. Uh, I recorded all the demos uh, that you see. Oops, sorry. The record the demos that you see while you're just watching the game running. Uh, get it all on discs and all that stuff. Our games, up until Wolfenstein... They all fit on a single disc. We had to, we actually made games to just cram them onto a three and a half inch and nothing bigger than that. Um, but now Wolfenstein 3D is just too big. I decided 
we needed two new tools, uh, one that could take a game's, say, zip file and chop it into pieces that would fit on multiple disks uh, for distribution, and then an install program that could take all of the data that was uh, spread over all those disks and combine it back again on a player's hard disk and then uncompress the game and then be able to run it. So I had to go really fast. <laughs> We're just days away from shipping this game. Um, I wrote the tool to split the zip file in six hours. I called it ICE, uh, short for Installation Creation Editor. Uh, next, I needed to create the de-ice program that everybody would be running, um, which took all the data on multiple disks and combined it and then unzipped it and everything. And I also want to make sure that players couldn't accidentally uh, mess up the installation if they tried to pull a disk out too soon, because back then people did do that often. So I wrote the installer in two days and it was used for years. Uh, I gave the tools to Apogee so they could use it for all of their future games because games were just getting bigger at the time. On May 4th, we felt the game was now ready. It was late at night um, and we just kept testing and testing. Everybody was at the office ensuring that the game was super solid. Jay was busy you know, making sure all the correct readme files and all the other shareware distribution files were in that zip. Um, and the clock rolls over into May 5th, um, and it's Adrian's birthday. <laughs> uh, Scott and George drove over uh, about 3 a.m., and uh, we logged into the Shareware Creations BBS, and we uploaded the 2 meg Shareware file at 4 a.m. So Dan Linton, who was the owner of, uh, of this BBS, which was in Massachusetts, <laughs> so he was up early. Um, he prominently displayed Wolfenstein 3D in uh, ASCII text art when people logged into his BBS. We all high-fived and we left uh, very tired, but we were really sure that everything had changed. Scott and George prepared for mass production of the discs, and we had to prepare you know, to make the rest of the shareware episodes by the end of May. <laughs> so Tom and I just start making levels like Mad Men. But sitting next to us was this Neo Geo with Fatal Fury and <laughs> Super Nintendo with Street Fighter 2. And, you know, we found that making the levels for Wolfenstein 3D was really boring <laughs> compared to making levels for Commander Keen, which are our side-scrolling games. So it was hard to focus on finishing the level, and we had to play fighting games basically just to wake up. Um, we did get the last 20 levels done to complete the trilogy by the 20th of May. And I made the master discs, and uh, that was for the, the share version. Gave them to Scott uh, so he could just start sending them to customers who ordered it. He said he hardly had any orders for the trilogy. So his marketing strategy worked once again, and 99% of all the orders wanted the entire $60 package. By the end of May, that total was 4,000 orders. <laughs> Wolfenstein 3D generated a quarter million in its first month, far eclipsing anything that Commander Keen had done. Well, that was quite the motivator. Uh, Tom and I burned the midnight oil, getting the final three nocturnal uh, episodes, you know, missions done. And Kevin had already started getting our next cube uh, ready to create the hint manual. He did a really great job, and he only needed map printouts by the, by the time you know he was done with the layout, um, and he needed the level hints uh, written by me and Tom. Since we made the levels, we're going to write how to get through them and do it as fast as we can. So we had a, a real blast writing that hint manual. It was a really a big highlight in the overall development of Wolfenstein 3D. Making the hint book funny was actually the goal for us, and coming up with creative ways Another creative way to tell the player to shoot the guard and get the key was our fun challenge. Because <laughs> Wolfenstein was such an adrenaline rush speed fest, I played the levels and I played them over and over again, hundreds of times. And I made a list of my fastest times for the shareware episode. So in the hit manual, we wrote those times on every page uh, for, for just the first episode's levels. And little did we know that we just kind of unofficially kickstarted the phenomenon of speedrunning on personal computers. So our next game, Doom, officially kicked off uh, speedrunning with the ability to record and play back your gameplay. So on June 15th, after testing, I made the master discs using ICE, drove them to Scott at Apogee, which was the first time we actually handed over an entire game in person. 
Um, previously, the discs were just sent to the mail because we're always somewhere remote. We're finally done making the game. The show episode took us four months to from start to ship. Uh, and the other five episodes of Wolfenstein 3D were done in basically a month and a half, two months. So in total, it took six months to make a six-episode game by a company of six people. Uh, this was in software in 1992. And those numbers would become significant for our next big game. But you already know that story. So thank you for listening to Wolfenstein 3D. <laughs> I think we have now uh, 10 minutes, amazingly, for questions, if anyone has any. Okay, right over here. Thanks very much. Fantastic talk. Can you remember any cool bugs or interesting bugs that occurred during your place testing? Um, not really. Uh, <laughs> It was with, perfect all the time. With our game, yeah, with our games, because we program, because we came from the 8 bit era and we programmed primarily in assembly language, we couldn't write too much code in assembly and, and not run it. Otherwise, we'd have a horrific amount of bugs. So we would write, like, you know, like say five, 10 instructions in assembly, run it. If there was a bug, it was only in those 10 instructions. So our, iter our, our, our uh, testing loops, our, our iteration times were really short. So that got us really used to uh, code a little bit, run it, code a little bit, run it. Anything that's wrong, you'll know immediately. And it's not like an hour's worth of work that you now have to spend another hour trying to figure out what happened. So that, with that, we, you know, ran the code that we made. <laughs> and then when it, ran, it worked, we would then give it to everybody else and it worked for everybody else. So we didn't have a bunch of bugs when we were making games back then. Um, and that was, you know, that was also not on a network. We were just handing disks to each other usually. Although with Wolfenstein, we did have a network finally. We just got one. Huh? Yeah, so it was funny. Um, <laughs> There's a story. Uh, probably three months ago, I'd say. Um, unbelievably, uh, me and John Carmack and Kevin Tom Hall all gave a talk to a group of students in New York at Rochester uh, Institute of Technology. Um, totally unexpected. It wasn't something that was a big planned thing, and uh, and, <laughs> and people couldn't believe it was happening because it was just random. Uh, but it just came up, and we all did a Zoom call uh, talking about design. And I told John, "Hey, you remember the push wall thing?" <laughs> How you didn't want to violate the sanctity of your engine <laughs> to code that push wall hack in. I said, I came up with a solution for it. I can't believe that we didn't do that. I didn't come up with it back then, but we had doors that opened sideways. Why couldn't we just have a secret door that opened sideways? It wouldn't have violated anything. <laughs> and he's just like, oh my God. <laughs> like it took 30 years, you know, <laughs> it's ridiculous. Um, yeah. Any other questions? Hi. Um, would would you have done anything differently with the process if you were to develop it now? Was there anything different uh, about you, how we made games back? Would then? you have done it differently? How would you do, would have done it differently? Um, geez. Well, we had to make our own tech back then. Today, we would have just used some tech, <laughs> and that would have taken care of a lot of things. Um, but a lot of the game development part is really similar. You know, where you try and get that core working immediately. And, uh, and when that's fun, then you can start building the other stuff on it. And we did that, you know, and then we started taking away the things that took away from that core. Um, so yeah, it's, it's like we weren't, we weren't writing design docs and we weren't doing a waterfall process where like, here's all the stuff we have to have in the game. Let's make the whole thing and then see if, we're, see if it's fun. We were just doing it as we were putting stuff in and getting rid of stuff as soon as we could because that, that actually wasn't fun. Okay, next thing, okay, get rid of that too. Well, this is fun enough, you know. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was. Uh, we didn't have a QA department that did, you know, even up until Quake, shipping Quake. We didn't write in C. It was all straight C. Um, we could just control everything that way. And uh, we didn't have QA because we ran the game constantly and tried breaking it all the time every time we ran it. So um, yeah, it was, it was, 
very different back then. But there, there, there were some bugs in our game, but they weren't evident to most people that played it. <laughs> They're kind of hidden. Uh, anybody? Yeah, right here. Hi, John. Um, so you had like a few months to make an insane amount of levels. Obviously, you play in like Street Fighter halfway <laughs> through it. Um, was there any like methodology to the creation of these levels? Did you know what you were going to create at the time, or is it just like put anything together because we got to get it out? Yeah, it's funny. The the so level creation process was the same. Like we had been making levels for a really long time. By the time we started on Wolfenstein, we'd been making games for about thirteen years. So. I had made, you know, Wolfenstein was my 87th game. And so that's a lot of levels. <laughs> so making levels I had found was always, was, was like, even today, always goes really well if I'm just thinking about what does the player see when they start? And I start building from that point. And sometimes I might have an overall idea. This is an installation with this at the exit or whatever. It's just a vague, like, look or, you know, the way of moving through something or make key areas, but it really is a lot of just organic creation of just like make the next room, connect some stuff, no, get rid of that thing, add these other things and just kind of make it that way instead of, you know, and, and you can do that with white boxing because like, that's kind of like the same thing. You're not trying to make it look good, but you're trying to make it feel good and play well. So it's like white boxing, but really putting you know, back then it was actually making it. <laughs> so, um, so it was a lot of that. It was a lot of just like create a level and then we're not really looking at the shape of the level from, from above. It, you know, in, in Wolf of Science data structure, the 2D matrix is this big, huge square with the same number of, of col columns and rows, but it was a mistake to try and fill it in because that's not, you're not trying to make a level that fills every corner of the thing. You're trying to make something that flows really well, whatever the shape is. So when you do look at, the level overhead, you know, it could be all kinds of weird with all kinds of empty space. And that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. If you had the hint book and you looked at it, you'd see empty space all over the place. And we did try to fill as much as, as, as you know, add more gameplay by putting some secret walls and have some really huge secret areas and stuff like that. But it was, it wasn't about like, okay, well, we have to fill every last inch, you know, and Tom only did that once really in one level, which ended up being the most mazy part of any game ever made. Uh, <laughs> that had a secret in it that if you if you went through this maze, which is insane, there's probably 60 doors you had to get right. And you get to a graphic that's just floating there that said, you know, call call Apogee and say uh, Snappity. <laughs> it was for it was for a, a it was going to be a contest. Whoever said that first would get a lifetime supply of Apogee games. And uh, and then the, we put a beta out, someone found it and just like on BBS says, hey, they said Snappity. And so we then changed it to Ardwolf, say Ardwolf. And, and, then, and then we put the game out and we knew never to do that again <laughs> after that point. <laughs> Hi. Um, yeah, really, really great talk. And I just want to say um, that it's amazing having both you and Brenda here at Develop. I find it really inspiring and um yeah i'm just it's amazing um i was given this game when i was eight years old because you're never too young to shoot yeah, nazis right. <laughs> apparently um <laughs> um i just um it's really like invested and amazed in this talk but also what struck me is um six developers six months the whole crunch culture and like the kind of history of making games and how, you know, there is a, obviously discussions all the time surrounding crunch. And I was wondering if you could speak a little bit to that and how that process then, and you know, I'm sure you all were just like, yeah, let's do this. Absolutely. But like, yeah. what, what, how does that translate <laughs> when you have staff and that, you know, in our mental health and everything surrounding that um, today? Basically. Sure. Yeah. Back then, um, even, even before we became a group, you know, as, as our little it's off for a group, we were making games like crazy. So I, even just immediately before that, I'm working at soft disc and I'm making games from 10 to six, you know, basically like normal hours. And then I go home and I'm making more games <laughs> and I'm selling them to soft disc. So we're doing this constantly and it's because we just love doing it. It's not because we had to like, you know, make a quota or anything like that. In fact, we did have these two-month deadlines in uh, 1991, 
1990 to, to basically make these games. We're making games every two months and just shipping them. And, uh, you know, we were making in 1991, we do two games at once, you know, because we want to get these games done so we can actually make our own stuff because we had a we had a contract to deliver. Um, but we we love doing it. You know, we were driven by by making games, and nobody else told they had to stay late. You know, they they stayed late because they wanted to, and if they needed to leave, they would just go. Um, and because we all had the same level of passion and excitement about what we were doing, nobody felt, you know, nobody felt bad when somebody left. It's like, yeah, we're all we all love what we're doing. Um, and then and then they go because they are just tired because they got to call their parents or like something is going on. Um, and they go and we just keep on working and, and making stuff and they get surprised when they come in the next day. And um, we were, it was like a, it was like a, 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 a rock band or something. Like we just lived together. Almost. We're in the same complex. I mean, we're just, we just love the, um, the creation of, of our games. And we had been doing it for a long time before we became a group in 1990, we'd been making games for 10 years alone. So getting together and being able to like, be super powered together to make something even better than, than, than us individually could make um, was super exciting and, and kept us really energized. And it wasn't until probably making Quake that actually we felt crunch because we, we basically had to force ourselves to get that game done. And, uh, and for us, it was, it was almost like, this is the definition of crunch when you don't want to be working late, you know, when you do want to be working late, that's passion and that's excitement and you're, you're going crazy uh, making cool stuff. But then when it's you're forced to do it, then, it, you know, because we've all made this decision and we're going to stay late, whatever, and you don't want to, that becomes crunch. And then that's not something anybody wants to do. So, um, yeah, we're not we're not crunch people. <laughs> we don't like doing it. I, I'd say I've probably only done it probably two to three times in my life. Crunched like insane hours. Um, and, uh, and obviously nobody wants to do that. I've been a company owner for a really long time. I don't want to do it. I don't want anybody in my company to do it. Um, so, uh, so we avoid it at all costs. It just means that we need to pad all of our schedules to make sure that when things go wrong, we have that extra time. And if we don't have that extra time, we're rescoping the game. We're not staying later. You know, we're going to make a, we're going to, we're going to put something off until later, uh, post ship or something. Nowadays, that's really great because, with live games, et cetera, you can push something uh, post ship. Um, so that actually kind of eases up if you kind of think in that way, just rescope, make things later, go for higher quality earlier. Um, and, uh, and, and maybe while you're developing the game and it turns, you know, you, the, the design changes a little bit, that thing that you would have been crunching for doesn't even need to be done anymore because the design changed. So um, yeah, so crunches, crunches when you don't want to do it. <laughs> and we're not here to make games you know, hating the amount of time that we're working late. So we only do it when we're passionate and excited about doing it. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, please don't take me for this question. I just want to ask you a little bit what you think about uh, the newest version of your uh, of your games. And I'm only asking because uh, uh, if you look at the games like uh, like Doom, they're getting they got reignited, uh, but they got reignited when they started doing again what you used to do, the things you designed uh, decades ago. And I wanted to know how you feel about that. Um, yeah, I, 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 first of all, I love the new game, the, the new Doom games. And the thing about the new, say, Doom 2016, which is a reboot, which is what Doom 3 was, it was a reboot again. It was the first reboot. But this is so many years later. Um, it was 2004, I think, when the first when when Doom 3 came out, it was kind of a reboot of the original game, which was still like 11 years earlier. So there's a lot of new people in the end playing games at the time. And then you go you go even forward, uh, even more years to 2016, um, and uh, and it's been how many years is that? 12 more years. So uh, there's a lot of new people playing games, you know. And so that reboot was really, you know. Telling the story that they all knew worked. It was getting uh, getting the essence of what Doom is today down because you can't just make that same game again. Uh, it has to be its own thing, but it has to like it has to embody the essence of what the game is, which was all about speed. It was all about killing demons and doing it, you know, really violently. So <laughs> comparatively, 
the game was extremely violent when it came out. And then, you know, we, they needed to kind of have the same thing. How do we get the same violence? Um, how do you make the game feel the same? That's a really hard part. And, uh, you know, the, the feel of that game, which is the core loop is just killing enemy, you know, demons with weapons. Um, they use the original game's timings to match the, the new game's timings. They, you know, if it took, you know, one to two shots to take down an imp with a regular shotgun, they would do that in the new one. So they were basically timing uh, and balancing all of, the, all of the weapons the same way. So the game felt the same. It just looked way cooler. And uh, I was very excited about it, especially the fact that they took seven, you know, seven years, four reboots. They needed to get it right, and they absolutely did. And then Doom Eternal could build off that base and and make something, you know, that they, they experimented with the game design even more, you know, with Doom Eternal. And now I'm really excited to see what the next one is, um, just because they're going to take what they learned from Eternal and make something that I don't think anybody has seen. So I, I think they've done a really good job there. I think the fact that they handed Wolfenstein Machine Games was the best move. Uh, all of those new Wolfenstein games are awesome. They're super fun. And I really like the direction that the story has taken. Um, and then Quake, uh, you know, I've been I've been personally wanting to see a reboot of Quake with the Lovecraftian episode, you know, Quake 1 kind of single player vibe. Um, and they've decided that Quake is a multiplayer game like Quake 3, as if that was the definition of it. Um, and so that's why Quake Champions was a was an arena shooter. And um, I feel that they've always done best, you know, when they've done their single player focus on on that world. And, and at some point, every, there were a lot of people saying that they wish that they would reboot uh, the game as well but to a Quake 1 type uh, design aesthetic. And I think Carmack had mentioned that that wouldn't be a bad idea either. So we'll see what happens if they do it. That'd be great. But, you know. They'll learn from Quake Champions as well and just do a, a better job. But I'm excited that they still have these three IPs and you know in uh, active development. <laughs> still, after you know 30 years with Wolfenstein and Doom's you know coming up on its 30th next year. Um, so yeah, I, I can't believe that these games are still being made. <laughs> Thank you. That was great. Thank you. Cool. Hi, John. I uh, just wanted to say thank you for a wonderful talk. Um, so as a developer, and you've been developing for a very long time, have you ever had a case where you had a bug, but then it turned into a feature? Since you've mentioned that uh, there were bugs in Wolfenstein, but it was not obvious for the players. So, no. <laughs> well, uh, I'll say, let's say one, one of them. One of them, well, it wasn't a bug. Rocket jumping is not a bug. <laughs> rocket jumping is part of the physics of the game that we never saw while we we're making it because why would you explode a rocket at your feet <laughs> and there were a lot of little bugs in the game that were not evident say in doom with like a silent bfg um silent bfg is awesome in deathmatch you know for people that just don't know about it where you can like shoot a bfg but they can't hear it um yeah, you know, it's basically there's one sound channel per player for their player uh, gunshots and stuff. But when you hit a wall and you press space bar to, to search a wall, that overrides your sound channel. It takes over. So if you're shooting anything that has a buildup, like a BFG has a buildup, you've just overridden it by going mm, on the wall and you've killed the sound. But that thing is still coming out. And uh, it's pretty it's pretty amazing when <laughs> you can shoot a BFG out and uh, it, it, like if on, on map one, there's these two long hallways and you can basically shoot a BFG down one hall, strafe to the longer hall and someone can be coming towards you and they just die because the BFG went off in the other room. But because of the way the game works, the cone of visibility is going to kill everything in front of you wherever you're located. Lots of little, little things like that is what experts use <laughs> against each other <laughs> or noobs. So <laughs> is this, uh, oh, I'm over, right? Oh, all right, five minutes. I can still, still do some questions. There's someone back here. <laughs> Hello, I uh, just want to say big fan, as I'm sure everyone else is in here. Uh, <laughs> Do you have any major regrets or anything that you wish you could have changed on not just Wolfenstein, but any of the games you sort of released like Quake and Doom that really irks you all these years later? 
Um, let's say I don't think that there's anything that really irks me. Um, things that could be done better, sure. Like um, the ending of Quake, just had. I think it was kind of a tough puzzle for people to figure out that you have to telefrag the final boss instead of mow it down with a bunch of ammo because uh, that's what you've been doing the entire game and now everything changes the final character. Um, that would have been a good change to make that easier. Um, not too many other things. I mean, we we did play the games constantly while we we're making them, which is really, really important to making a good game. It's just constantly play it. And we took things out. We put things in um, the whole the whole time. Uh, it, so, you know, we we could look back sometimes and go, uh, you know what? We should have like made the hit points on this a little bit bigger. Like Spider Mastermind should have had probably three times the amount of hit points. Um, but every other character was pretty great in the game. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, there was, there was, there's not a lot of big things in those games that we made that we would go back and say that we change that we should change. Like, especially when you look at the amount of time that we took making it, that's as much as we could do in that time. Wolfenstein from idea to shipping shareware was four months and that's really fast. Um, the year before we made 13 games in 1991. And uh, we wouldn't really go back and just pack more stuff in each of those games because we needed to ship that stuff. Uh, with Wolfenstein, though, it was the first game that we made that we actually said we can take as long as we need to make a really great game. We don't need to ship on a schedule. So we spent twice as much time and, and did it in four months. <laughs> um, but, you know, it was it was uh, that's how long it felt like it needed to be for us. It, you know, we could have spent more time on Wolfenstein and added some more design stuff that would have made the big game better. I guarantee we could have done some stuff like that. But when we were making Doom, we also did the same thing as we did in Wolfenstein. We had a lot of stuff in Doom we ripped out because it just didn't make sense. We actually did a design doc for the first time in Doom, and we disregarded it <laughs> because it just didn't make sense while we were making the game. Um, we had score, we had lives, all that kind of stuff that we had in Wolfenstein. We ripped them all out because it didn't make sense for Doom. Why are you getting score? You know, like for what? Uh, why, why would you penalize the player for dying three times and start the whole game over again. Why not just let them keep on trying? So, um, so we started to kind of get rid of these arcade era design uh, ideas and, and focus more on like, what's the, what's the experience we're trying to get across and how can we get people to the end of the game? So they want to buy the rest. <laughs> it's important to finish that free episode to actually want the other ones. Um, Cause then you feel like maybe you can't finish those other ones. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, I don't think that there's a lot of stuff we would have changed. We would have tweaked some things, but I think overall that we got everything in those games that we really wanted in there. Right here. Thank you very much. <laughs> got to have a microphone. Oh, okay. He's first. That's right. He's first. Hi. Uh, yeah. Sorry about that. Thank you for the talk. It was beautiful. Uh, aside from that, my question would be back then it was one of the first games that had like proper texture mapping in 3D. So did you have a feel back then for textile density or did you have an idea of how you want to like manage your texture memory back then? Because you'd see like a slate or an idea of what your base texture would be. We were um, still with Wolfenstein, we we're still limited to the lower one meg of memory. Um, we weren't using 32 bit addressing or anything. We waited for Doom to do that. So we were still limited in how much memory you could have. Those texture maps and memory were uncompressed, so they could be... Uh, in fact, the renderer that we wrote for Wolfenstein was a self-modifying code renderer. So we actually generated code and then executed the code for every uh, vertical strip across the screen to get super speed in uh, VGA chain 4 mode. So we were, you know, we were um, maximizing that memory. Uh, I know that we could have added a few more graphics and stuff in there for some extra gameplay stuff, but it was it was pretty like we focused on the speed and that was a lot of uncompressed data to move. Um, and uh, so that was kind of where our focus was to. So when Carmack was done with the engine, just getting it running, then he kept on optimizing it past that point. Uh, all of the AI in the game was done in days. It was really easy to do that stuff. Um, but yeah, it was. It was what, else, what what other part of that question did you want to know? Just in general, if you had like a basic size for each texture and based on that, you kept going on there. 
Yeah, those were the textures were all the same size, pretty much. They were, um, I think, one twenty eight by one twenty eight, something like that, um, just for for zooming. And we had some experience with Catacomb three D with like how big before you start scaling up. Most of everything in Wolfenstein is scaling down, so we wanted the the size of when you kind of got up to a wall to be not really scaled up too much. Um, and it was all just a balance of like how much memory, you know, the screen is 200 pixels high, a chunk of the screen at the bottom is taken up with your status bar. So you're looking at 180 pixels or something. So we did a 128, uh, so it's not too many scaled pixels. Um, and that's just what felt good to us memory wise. Uh, and also, I guess, just with the code that we would be uh, writing <laughs> to do to do the blitting. Um, yeah, but we didn't, it wasn't a lot of time. It was, it was, it was done probably in a day figuring out what is the right size for these textures for this game for the resolution that we were in. We didn't make a 640 by 480 version because that would have been too long. All right, time's Thank up. You. So uh, thanks for all the questions, everybody. And uh, I'll figure out the next talk. People have told me they want to hear about Daikatana. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see if that's next. Um, but yeah, have fun at, uh, at the next uh, talk, wherever you're going. <laughs>